side of the body, uh, just in a very simple way uh, without uh, any kind of um, invasive intervention. In particular, one example, one thing that I enjoy uh, when I see patients is you look on the white part of the eye and you see the blood, the, uh, blood vessels on the white part of the eye, which is called a sclera. And you can actually see individual red blood cells moving like cars weaving through traffic. It's a beautiful sight. And one thing that's very interesting is that when you think about continuity, right, the human body is completely connected. So a red blood cell that's located, that courses through one of these blood vessels, also courses through at some point in its life. I don't your, know. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, uh, Abel. I don't know if you have shared your slide. You can't see from Oh, me. wait a second. Can you guys not see my screen? No. Oh, you know, I'm so glad you didn't wait. Oh, thanks for letting me know. I'm so glad we didn't get all the way to the end before I realized that uh, this. Okay, good, good, good. Let me go ahead and do that now. Share. Can you guys see it now? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank oh, you, sir. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Because I think my brother gave a talk and he got all the way to the end, you know, last year on Kaggle before he was informed that, that he wasn't on screen. Um, okay, good, good, good. I'm glad I was only one minute in. Um, so yeah, so I'll, you know, I'll start over because I was actually illustrating with, with this as I was going through. So here we are. Um, yeah, so you guys can see this picture of the retina. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Great, and can you see my cursor as well? Yeah. Yes. Oh, perfect. perfect, perfect. So yeah, I was illustrating this, you know, picture here. This is a picture of the retina, and um, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of the retina. Obviously, uh, I'm a retina specialist, so I'm fellowship trained in retina, and I treat patients with retinal disease. You know, things like diabetic retinopathy, um, macular degeneration, um, retinal detachments, etc. There's a slew of, of uh, disorders, and it's a subspecialty of ophthalmology, which is you know the eye. So um, it, it, there's a lot of training that's required. It's after medical school, you go for four more years of training and then you're treating patients that in this, what is really about one inch by one inch uh, tissue. And that's all, all that we do as retina specialists. But I was mentioning how the retina has very special significance to science and to, I would say human civilization in general uh, that goes even beyond its medical relevance. Clearly vision is important, right? Um, they did a survey uh, about 10 years ago, um, I think it was the American Academy of Ophthalmology, I believe, um, that uh, asked people what, you know, who had, whether they would rather die of cancer or go blind. And surprisingly, a lot of people said they would rather die of cancer than go blind. And so clearly vision is an important thing to us. Um, vision is intricately connected with intelligence, right? And so the field of computer vision, which is what, um, I do, you know, as a computer scientist, and that is what uh, I also do as, if you will, as an entrepreneur and a founder of a company. Uh, we are essentially a computer vision company focusing on a very specific um, uh, problem. But the retina I'm mentioning its uh, special significance because it is a, an extension of the central nervous system. This thing here is the, what is this? You, most of you are probably muted, but this is the optic nerve, right? And this then goes straight to the brain, uh, like a cable that gets all of the light and all of that information and takes it right to the brain. So from a central nervous perspective, we, we're going to be talking today primarily about neural networks. And really the motivation for these neural networks came directly from our understanding, when I say R at large, of how neurons work and how they can communicate um, with each other and the concept of a receptive field uh, and how there's a hierarchical cascade to their organization. Um, that, those insights were directly translated into building architectures that worked and are able to learn uh, through some of the earlier work by a gentleman named Kunihiko Fukushima who built the neurocognitron um, out of the work of Hubble and Weasel. Uh, Hubble and Weasel's work was about in the 60s. 
the neocognitron uh, by Kunihiko was in about 1979 um, in Japan. He's still alive. And so he is the pioneer of the modern, uh, of the neural network, you know, and of how these um, algorithms are trainable and are able to learn uh, things such as um, handwritten digit character recognition. Okay, so um, with very little modification of Kunihiko Fukushima's work, uh, Yan Lekun in 1985, you know, uh, implemented LUNET, which uh, gained uh, some popularity. Uh, and then, you know, there was the so-called winter of uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, and, you know, through the success of deep uh, algorithms that utilized uh, this same approach, this pretty much exact same approach um, in the uh, visual recognition challenge and started to have success, then there was suddenly a lot of awareness about the importance of this type of work. So there's, a, there's so many layers of connection here, so many layers of connectivity. When you start to look at, uh, think about things like the nervous system uh, at the basic building block level of neurons, the way that that is organized, when you start to think about things like vision and the central importance of that to intelligence. And then when you start to think about healthcare, you know, and uh, the importance of, of us as humans in the way we perceive our work, our world through vision, uh, you'll see that uh, it's, I'm, I'm very happy to be at the intersection that I am uh, right here. So we are going to delve into a, a lot of the details, mathematical details of neural networks. We will cover, you know, all of the core in this, we have about two hours, right? Um, we, we may not take all of the time, but I, I reserve some time at the end to sort of con continue this conversation. Um, and at the end, I wanna talk more, more generally about how you should be positioning yourself as you are learning. Um, uh, I know a lot of you are at different levels, stages of this. Some of you are veterans and are compete on Kaggle and you know, know this stuff back and forth. And while some other people uh, might have heard the word deep learning for the first time this year, uh, and you're all you're all here, um, but I have some relevant, uh, what I believe is relevant career advice for you at the end in terms of how to position yourself and what to spend time learning so that you're not um, caught unawares. Um, you guys can still see my screen. You can see the next slide here. Yes, sir. Okay, great. I just wanna see, it looks like I might have, I wanna make sure if I have question, uh, comments, uh, optic nerve head. Okay, good, good. Exactly. Yeah, that's the that was the optic nerve. You know, as as I correct, uh, somebody got it right there. Very good. Um, fantastic. Um, so, so look at this here. So I mentioned the problem that we're solving. So there's there's a lot of amazing, beautiful science. There's a lot of history. Um, there's a lot of, uh, at the intersection of, you know, mathematics, computer science, neuroscience, vision, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that is all, all well and good. Um, ultimately, to move in using AI, using deep learning to make a difference in people's lives, um, it's, it's a lot of nitty gritty work, right? You kind of have to focus and hone in on solving problems. And it ends up being a lot of problems of engineering. Um, really, if you're going to move this into a solution that changes somebody's life, that enhances somebody's life uh, one way or the other, you're going to find yourself doing a lot of engineering work. And I'm going to come back to this, you know, uh, discussing some of the things that, because a lot of the challenges and the problems that you would encounter, uh, if you decide to make um, deep learning, AI, machine learning, a key part of your career or to make a career out of this, um, you will find that um, you're having to largely, you know, become an engineer. And uh, I think the sooner that you that that is understood, the better. Um, so this is sort of a general framework of what we're we're solving in our company, Redna AI. Um, here is a gentleman who is in the clinic, right? Um, walks in to see a primary doctor, the GP, general practitioner, and say this gentleman is diabetic. Um, so he has to have an eye exam once a year. A lot of people in the world are diabetic. Um, I see there are 135 people in this chat right now. 
Um, so my guess is that anywhere between 10 and 20 people on the chat here have diabetes or diabetic. Um, it's, we're, it's more of a younger crowd here. Uh, so type two diabetes is often age related and, and comes on later in life. And so uh, perhaps I would adjust that number and say that at least five people you know, on this chat are, are diabetic. Um, so diabetes is a common problem. Half a billion people in the world suffer from it. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of people. So this, say this gentleman goes to his eye, eye doctor, um, I mean, goes to his primary doctor. One important thing is that people with diabetes have to have an annual retinal exam. That's a specialized exam. It requires all sorts of, you know, um, Star Trek futuristic looking gadgets that we strap on our heads and we have lenses and we do uh, these things and we've gone through um, years of schooling to be able to know exactly, you know, what's going on in someone's eyes. That service is a, a specialty care. It's not always available, you know, in, in a lot of the world, um, it's not there. And it comes down to an issue of ec economics, something that I am starting to understand better uh, myself. Uh, in terms of um, a country, a country as large as Nigeria with as populous as you know, 200 million people um, has uh, a very, very small number of um, people who are practicing uh, as retina specialists. There are more people that are trained to do it than are able to practice. And so I would say the number is under 10, you know, and that's, um, that is uh, shocking. You know, it's so certainly not uh, sufficient to provide the care that's needed, right? So if you look at what we're trying to solve, this person goes in their primary care clinic, has a picture taken of their retina, and they shoot that picture, we shoot that picture into the cloud where we pass it through a neural network. We're gonna be learning about this, about the mathematics of this, about the computer science of this today. Um, but I just wanna show you this use case, which is a big deal. Um, and so you're then able to scan this using AI, using deep learning and have a result as to whether or not this person has diabetic eye disease. No retina specialist required. The primary doctor doesn't know anything about the, the retina, they're not been trained to, to do that. But if they have a camera in their office and we have a connection to the cloud and we have our algorithm trained in the cloud, you can just press a single button and within three seconds, you'll get a result as to whether this person uh, is okay to go home or whether they need to go and be sent to the eye doctor who might be in another town, another state, or in some cases, in a lot of cases, too many cases, another country. Um, there are countries in this world without a single retina specialist um, and uh, we get the data from maybe from Twitter, from different sources. We scrape data from maybe Twitter. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. We had an interference there, which is gone. Um, yeah, there are countries that border Nigeria that have not a single retina specialist. Niger, uh, Chad, you know, are examples. You know, where there's a really, uh, to my knowledge, only one ophthalmologist, and so there's a big global problem of access to care. And a lot of what motivates us is uh, the beauty and the power of being able to use technology, um, this technology that's now available to solve a lot of these problems and to begin to address them. Okay, so let's now, since this deep learning is so important and so powerful, let's now dive into it. So I'm gonna use this schematic as sort of a landscaping for you to see where we are in the grand scheme schema and what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna be talking about neural networks primarily, and that's like this part right here. Um, the notion of a convolutional neural network is not uh, remote it's from that, it's just a single additional step, which involves a so-called dot product. Um, that's a concept from linear algebra, which uh, I hope most of you are familiar with. Linear algebra is the single most important subject that uh, any, any aspiring machine learning person or scientist period uh, must learn and understand. Um, and so the, there's a operation called convolution. Uh, and so that's where this convolutional neural network comes from. And uh, convolution is, if you will, it's a fancy way to think about the dot product in an instance where your vectors are two dimensional, you know, mats like a JPEG image such as this. And so you're doing this so-called similarity measure. Um, one way to think about that is if you have two pictures that are identical, uh, their dot product or their convolution should be one, uh, if you will. And if you have two pictures that are completely opposites of each other, then their dot product or their convolution would be zero. And so you use that to generate these feature maps and you go forward. We're not gonna talk in detail about this today, 
but um, we're going to be talking about this essential part, which is the core motif of, of, of all deep learning architectures. And then at the end, we're going to then come back to the problem of what does it mean to, to be economically competitive within the data science landscape uh, from a career perspective, uh, what skill sets should you be targeted or at least have in mind? Uh, so let's now dive into this part, deep learning. What is it? Um, any, so, so this is a very quick uh, Google search that I did. I did a quick Google search to see what will come up um, on Google images if I search for deep learning. And it's amazing what you get, right? Um, there's a huge diversity of, of things on here that uh, you can see. And um, all types of different uh, neural networks are visible uh, on this uh, image. You, can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you can see that there's a huge plethora of architectures, um, and if you zoom out even more, wow! There's even a whole lot more. All types of shapes. All types of you know. Even this one is even shaped like a brain. It seems like. And then this one tapers all the way down. This one expands and then tapers again. And it's, it almost seems like there's no limit in terms of what they can look like. You, what you do see that seems to be common to all of them is that they're somehow connected by these lines. And so let's go ahead and take a look and see, ask ourselves what that, what that is. Um, so deep learning is really using deep neural networks because you can see that the neural networks, those connections are the commonality to this wide range of things that fit the term deep learning, at least per Google. Um, so we can refine our question perhaps, because what does it mean to be deep, right? Would you say a hundred layer network is deep? Um, I think most people will probably nod and say, yeah, it is. Uh, but then what about a million layer network? Then that's clearly deeper. And it suddenly makes the hundred layer network look shallow. Um, and then somebody might show up you know, someday with a billion layer network, wow. And so now your million layer network is not even that deep. Uh, and so it's clearly a vague term, the deep, and um, it's not a defined term. There is no def definition or agreeable definition for it, nor is there any meaningful definition for it devoid of the data. What do I mean by that? I mean that certain problems might be very clear, apple versus orange, right? Or dog versus cat. And, you know, dogs might look um, significant, or rather I should say cat versus car. Cars might look significantly different from cats that you might have a hundred layer network is able to tell the difference in a few iterations. However, if you then start to talk about uh, cat versus dog, then they both are, you know, four legged animals with ears, right? Uh, and a tail. And so suddenly it might be that your hundred layer network might not be deep enough or expressive enough to capture the differences. And so you then have to extend it further. Maybe you get to a million layers and then you're, or a thousand layers, now you're, you're okay. Now you can tell the difference apart. But then so suddenly somebody comes out and says, what about a German shepherd versus a Shetland sheepdog? And your thousand layer network might not be sufficient. You might have to increase the expressivity of it. Uh, but then, you know, you, you, you also have to be careful when you start to become an expert, which uh, a lot of you have already become, you start to understand things like overfit, right? You can't just indiscriminately increase the depth of your network. There then becomes, you know, give and take pros and cons, fine tuning and uh, nuances that you have to pay attention to. So the relevant question is the, oh, I'm sorry, the, the important question to ask is really what is a, Try to get this out of my way here. Let's see what I do. One sec. Mm. Okay, let's see. Sorry guys, I'll figure this out in a second here. Oh, there you go. Okay, we'll put it up there for now. Um, the important question, uh, is what is a neural network? That's the common thing to all of this that matters most. And this, this is what a neural network looks like, right? So you have here an input layer, uh, you have a hidden layer, 
you have an output layer. That's just a simple three layer schemata of what a neural network is. Um, neural networks don't have to have a hidden layer. You know, we could have had two layers and it's still a neural network. It's a network of connected nodes uh, for which there's some, you know, mathematically describable relationship between the inputs, you know, that yield the output where there's weights or rules. And, and that's, that's what essentially the topic of today is, is how do you do that translation? So the very first layer is your data. You can think of that as your um, image of your retina, in this case, or your image, your picture of the cat or the dog, uh, or a, a text, a body of text, a corpus that you got from a Twitter API that you want to use for sentiment analysis. If you're doing NLP, um, it could be anything. It could be a song um, that you downloaded off of the internet and you have a uh, sound file you know, for that, a WAV file. And so the frequencies of the song, it could be any kind of data that you're looking to do machine learning on. And data is discrete when you're gonna use a computer. And so you can represent them as these dots, how many dots and what type of information are inside of those dots. And any, any kind of data that you would uh, pass through a computer can be represented like this. Um, and then the weights are these measures that yield you know, the next layer of the network. And then you keep doing that until you get an output. And when you get that output, your output is your prediction, for example. So in the case of uh, my example of what we're, we're solving, um, you have the picture of a retina and you would at the output be saying whether um, that patient is has diabetic eye disease or not, or you're looking at some other uh, metric, some other uh, prognostic, some other uh, disease that you're looking for in the retina, maybe it's macular degeneration, maybe it's glaucoma, or maybe it's a systemic thing like high blood pressure, you know, hypertension, but it's yes or no, you know, binary, but it needs not be yes or no, it can be um, uh, other things as well, you know, like you can, you can have, you know, apple, orange, dog, cat, whatever. As we saw with those pictures we searched on Google, you can represent the, um, the neural network, however you want. There's so much flexibility in how you define the architecture, right? So here you have uh, the output, which is your prediction. Now, what is the learning part of, of deep learning? The learning part of deep learning is that you initially just have these weights, random weights. These are numbers, they're rules. We're gonna go into details, you know, on the next, in the coming slides of what they look like, what they are. Um, but then initially they're random and they're giving you random predictions, which are wrong, almost definitely. And so when you get that, you have to have a way to check. So you, if you knew that the picture you're checking is indeed a picture of a cat, and these things say they're dog, then you have to have a way to penalize the system. And the score is a way to measure how far off was this prediction. That's called the loss function. We're going to talk about that today in detail as well, uh, in some detail, I should say. And so when you can measure how far off it is, you know how you need to change it. How do you need to change these weights to teach these weights so that they can learn deep learning, what, how to actually do the prediction correctly. And so you have to have a lot of data to teach them because they need a lot of examples and back and forth. And that is the mechanic of a neural network. And, and that's what we're talking about today, right? So you've got all of that inside of this picture already. Now, the weights are, you know, there's a, a certain rule by which they're summed, uh, and and then there's a, a there's a, a nonlinearity activation that's applied to the summation of those rules. You know, that might sound like a mouthful for some of you, uh, but don't worry, we're going to dissect that, you know, in the coming slides and uh, make very specifically clear what that means. Um, how do you take that picture of a cat or a dog? Uh, and what do, how do you transform that picture into a prediction as to whether it's a cat or a dog so that regardless of any picture you're given to the model, once it's trained, it's able to tell you. And so there are certain critical things that are involved. There's the idea of multiplying things together and adding them up. Um, and then there's the notion of doing a nonlinearity transformation to that. You've heard of terms like, you, uh, some of you have heard terms like ReLU, sigmoid, uh, tan age and things like that. We're going to talk about that as well. And then you get an output prediction. And we just saw in the previous slide that you have to then compare this to the uh, this prediction to the actual target, the actual label, 
And that's your forcing function that then allows the network to iteratively learn you know, what it's supposed to know. Okay, so here we are with, um, I'm trying to make this thing just disappear altogether, but I, I'm, I don't know that that's hide video panel. Yeah, that, that was good. Um, great. So, so um, let's see, let's go back. Yeah, so I like to break this up into two parts. I like to break up the um, neural network into two components. And I talked about this in May. Uh, when we when we went over the mathematics of neural networks, you'll see a lot of the same concepts in today's lecture as well, because um, they haven't changed since May. Um, so there's uh, neural network anatomy, which is what is the structure of a neural network? What does a neural network look like physically? Um, physically, quote unquote. And then neural network physiology. How does neural network work? You know, what is the dynamics of it? in terms of allowing it to do what it was created to do. So we have a number of concepts here. We have the concept of input data. I've talked about that and given you guys different examples. You've seen a retinal picture. Uh, we mentioned uh, sound files, you know, video, video files would be an example, text files, like a Twitter feed that has sentiment of angry, sad, you know, happy, likely to buy a product or whatever one is building. Um, you can uh, feed that in here, and it's always discretizable. And then there's the concept of nodes, right? And nodes are these little circle dots that are, that delineate a layer of the network, you know, the start of a layer of the network. And it could either be the, in the very first node, that's the data itself. And then you have inter intervening nodes. And then you have an output node, which uh, typically that's your prediction, the last one that comes out of it. Um, or, you know, pretty much, you know, we can say that for now. That's your prediction or that's your so-called feature vector um, because sometimes you train a network to a point and then you use it to do other stuff down the line, but we're not gonna go into that, you know, in today's lecture. Um, and then you have weights and these weights are the, they're the knowledge. They're the knowledge that the network is learning. And so they are the things that change. So initially they're random which means the network has zero knowledge when it starts out. Uh, and then over time, they start to acquire a structure that is meaningful and that is insightful. Uh, and they, you change them in a very specific way uh, using uh, something called uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and, and specifically back propagation is a, a way to computationally expedite the process. We will talk about that today. Um, and these weights then begin to change and learn and adapt to understand the problem that you're solving. And eventually they get to the point that after enough iterations, they now understand that domain, meaning that they can now tell uh, a cat from a dog or they can tell a retina that does not have diabetic retinopathy from one that does. And at the, then you have the activations, which they enrich this process, right? Because linear system, the world is highly nonlinear. And certainly our knowledge is, is extremely nonlinear. Um, however, you'll see that the, the connections between any two consecutive layers is linear because these are, these are actually the definition of linear, if you will, um, transformation. Uh, but so you have to then do something to that output, that linear output um, to make it nonlinear, to give it richness, to give it texture, to give it the power to have a nonlinear decision boundary and wrap its mind around complex concepts that are intricately um, defined, like the difference between a Shetland sheepdog and a German shepherd, even though they look very similar, but they're not the same. And our brains are able to map itself around this problem so that you can then see these two dogs and say that um, it, that it's not the same, right? Um, so yeah, those are the activations and then you have the loss at the end. And then the physiology, as I mentioned, is the dynamics of it. How does that learning occur? What is the, me me uh, the mechanism by which learning occurs in neural networks? And it's stochastic gradient descent is our optimization method. Optimization is, is a term that just means, you know, the learning process. It, it, it's the, this type of problem is one in which you are minimizing 
some objective function. And that's your so-called loss function. So that general class of problem is called optimization. And in this case, the way that it's done is stochastic gradient descent. We've heard of that before. The stochastic part, again, is simply a computational approximation that speeds up the computation. That's all it is. So it's really gradient descent. That, that's what you need to really understand here. The stochastic part, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, we'll talk about that. And then backpropagation, we'll talk about that as well, is uh, how do we efficiently, com with computational efficiency, um, solve this uh, gradient descent problem. So here is a two-layer neural network, right? And I mentioned that the transformation between your input data and the very next layer, or really between any two layers, is a linear transformation. What does that mean, linear? Um, what, what, is, what is linearity? I'm gonna throw this one to, to you guys. Let me, let me go in the chat room. Let's see. What is linearity? Straight line, you know, I like that. So a straight line is an example of, of linearity. Um, input equals output is an example of linearity. Uh, um, Ome Chupemeka says that linearity simply suggests it follows straight line. Th those are examples, yes. Um, and then uh, Uluagbunga says that a property that can be represented on a straight line, uh, Abu Salam Oladakwa says that an expression to the order of one, Obe says is mx plus, y is mx plus b. Yeah, I like that, we're getting there. Um, uh, Quadri Hassan says power of one, uh, equation in a straight line. Okay, good, good. You guys suggest one dimensionality, straight line equations, order of one, relation, between variable, um, one dimension, uh, input maps. Okay, good. So we have a general concept. A change in input gives a corresponding change in output. We have a general concept straight. Yeah, you know, we have a general concept of what linearity means. Um, and those are, I would say, those are examples of linearity that really uh, do touch on uh, on the on the core con idea that linear, linearity is. But linearity is a very math, it's a very specific mathematical term. I'm gonna put it in here. I'm gonna type this uh, on the chat. I'm gonna say linearity is the following thing. So T is a linear map. I know, I know uh, those at home can't see what I'm typing, but I'm saying what I'm typing. T is a linear map if, if here T of AX, plus by equals a and a and b are constants okay it equals a t of x plus b t of y where where um a b are constants and x Y are variables. You know, I love, I was a math major in college, so I, I, would, I love chalkboard, right? You can't really replicate it, um, uh, the, the sort of dynamics of, of a chalkboard, but we're doing our best here. So um, let me actually see if I can do something interesting. I'm, I just copied this, boom. And I'm gonna see if I can actually come out of share screen or let me see. One second. Anyway, I'm not gonna complicate life for us unduly. But yeah, linear, so that's what linearity is. I wanted to see if I could post what, if I could uh, post what I just wrote to this here. Um, so yeah, um, so that's what linearity is. So linearity is that uh, when given two variables, x, y, and t is a linear map, a, b are constants, a of, a t of x, uh, a a of I mean t of a x plus b y equals a t of x plus b t of y. So it simply means that you can break the thing apart and you can pull out the constants from there. And so you guys were talking about, um, and it simply means that the effect of the transformation 
on a given input vector is scale independent. So that means if you take the input vector and you double it, the output would be doubled. If you take the input vector and you shrink it in half, the output would be shrunk in half. If you take the input vector and you add another input vector to it, the output would be the sum of the two individual outputs. It simply means that it follows the rules you would expect and there are no surprises. It means that proportionality holds in all cases. That's what linearity is. It's a powerful uh, concept. It's really the thing that we do understand you know, in the physical world and things that are nonlinear are harder you know, to get our minds around, but the world is nonlinear. And so we have to sort of resort to approximations. When we're doing deep learning, we have to take this linear thing, this linear transformation, and then non-linearize it to, to add shrinkages and dilations and contractions that are not correspondent to proportions. Clearly, a picture of a cat and the binary concept of cat versus dog are completely geometrically different in their shape, right? Uh, you can imagine. And so how do you go from that picture to this single binary output that encodes the notion of cat. You have to warp the thing quite a bit. You have to twist it, you have to stretch it, you have to pull it. You can't just be doing proportionality shrinkage, shrinkages. You can't just take that picture of cat and then shrink and expand by, you know, by discrete proportions. You'll never get there. And so that's why the um, activation functions are so, so critical to this process and to making all of this work correctly. Let me take a quick peek at the chat again. I've got some questions on there. Um, Yep, associativity. That is absolutely uh, one of the properties of linear maps. Yep, uh, they're additive. Yep, these are properties of linear maps. Yes, indeed. Um, oh, somebody says I can log onto a whiteboard online and use that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to dare that, you know, right now <laughs> because uh, I, I suspect that we would, it might take up more time than, than we can afford. Um, we're already 45 minutes in. I would have loved to do that, but let's, let's, let's carry on for now. Um, thanks for the suggestion though. So here we are. So um, this is, how do we do the transformation? So now we know what linearity is. We know that the basic operations between layers of a neural network are linear operations. And we know that we need to warp the output of those um, linear operations so as to get more expressivity to actually be able to converge on the solution. So this linear step is defined as follows. So, so basically you, you have an input, input uh, data, x1, x2, x3. This whole thing here is your input data. Um, you take that and there is a rule or weights that connect this input to all of the output. This is the so-called densely connected network where every input is connected to every output. Your, your neural network does not have to have that property as we saw with the Google search there's any and every type of thing you can think about is probably legal uh, and, and would work you know, in, in the right circumstance or is the right solution for certain uh, circumstances. So you have this X1 and you say X1, uh, actually, let's see, someone say I can log on. To, yeah, it's really tempting for me to try to get this whiteboard thing to work here, but probably just uh, stay the course. Here we are. So. Um, you, you have these weights, initially random, eventually uh, honed uh, to the problem you're solving. And here you have weight uh, W11, W21. As you'll see in this nomenclature, uh, there's, this is vector one. And so one is the last digit of the two digits uh, there. And the number of digits is simply saying the, um, the number of output that you have here. So uh, we'll see how this works and then X2, uh, here, the weights that are, uh, this is coming from input vector two or data input point two. So you have W12 and W122. Uh, and what does that mean? So 22 goes from input two to output two. One two goes to output one from input two. Same thing with three, you have one three it's going to output one uh, from input three, and you have two, three going to output two from input three. And you guys would have access to these slides so you can kind of go over this again and see, make sure that it's clear 
And this operation here is a linear operation. This is sort of the standard operation um, in linear algebra. It's called, what is this called? <laughs> what, so what is this called here? So Chido Ziagbu has already run ahead of us and solved the first part of that. I like that. Very good, very good. It's, it's called yes. And Omega is, has given us the answer there. Uh, it's matrix vector multiplication. So you take the vector and you multiply it by this. And the way that it works is it's, you take this and then you bend it, you, you just flatten that out. So this X1 ends up, you can imagine this uh, vertical becoming horizontal. So this X1 is multiplied by uh, W11, X2 is multiplied by W12, X3 is multiplied by W13. And then you sum those three together. And um, I, uh, I like what uh, Doziagbo, you guys can look at what Doziagbo has posted there. He's posted the operation, the way you multiply each one of those, sum them together to get H1. Same thing happens for H2. You have X1 multiplied by W21, X2 multiplied by W22, X3 multiplied by W23, you get the H2, right? But then as we said, we have to then work that if we're ever going to get anywhere with our uh, training. And so we then apply some activation function to that. And you will see what types of activation, what options we have for that as well. Okay, good. And uh, so this is the same process, but I'm just showing, showing it here for an additional layer. And it's the exact same thing again. So for this next layer, the input, what this is just saying is that the input into layer two is the output from layer one. And you can continue for a billion layers with that same process. Once you know how to go from layer one to layer two, you know how to go from layer one zillion to layer one zillion plus one and you know how to build any network of any length, right? Because it's just about simply adding uh, more to the process in that way. Um, so here we are, and it's the exact same process. These are the inputs into here, and then you just simply take those weights. These weights are encoded in a matrix form, and you do the multiplication. It's a linear transformation, and you get these outputs, and then you apply an activation function uh, to that as well, okay? And um, it's, it's very interesting because the size, the shape, size and shape of your weight matrix tells you something, tells you very specifically what the shape of that layer is, right? So here you have um, input that is two layer input, two dimensional input. And the number of rows tells you the shape of the output and a two-dimensional output. And if I go back, you can see exactly that right here. Two-dimensional input, two-dimensional output. So the matrix is gonna be a two by two matrix in that case. However, in this case, previously we had three-dimensional input and two-dimensional output. So look at that, three by two, because this is the length of the input right there. So you'll have three columns, and the output had just two things. So you had two rows based on the operation, all right? So this is something that some of you would have to go back and look over it again and make sure that you understand why that is um, the way that it is, all right? So again, it's just a matter of repeating the process. And so here you are, you know, adding, doing the activation and then you get the uh, layer of the output that happens there. Now, this is another, this is a, a wild looking shape, right? It's like you start out with three, uh, three dimensional input, you shrink it down to two, and then you expand it out again. Um, it's, and this has significance, you know, it has application significance. Um, does anybody know what this general shape might, does it remind you of anything in particular, any class of algorithms, you know, within uh, machine learning world? Yeah. Exactly. So, um, uh, Daramola Ulua uh, Dami Fogore says that uh, you, you nailed it, man. Um, he says it looks like an autoencoder. Absolutely does look like a, uh, an autoencoder. And the idea there with autoencoders is that you're trying to compress data. So, this part here is called a uh, uh, latent vector, latency. So you take data, you compress it, 
and then you try to blow it back up. And you oftentimes are trying to teach the network to learn what it can toss, which parts of this input data can it afford to lose if you're going to be able to reconstruct it back. And that often requires training. So that's also a process that um, has lots of applications in you know, signals processing, uh, sound, you know, any, anywhere that you're compressing files and transmitting them over the wire, like zip, you know, and so, so things of that sort, of that nature, or uh, um, uh, things where we've seen a lot of amazing applications uh, of deep learning, where uh, you are doing image to image translation. For instance, you have uh, face to sketch, sketch to face, uh, and all sorts of, all sorts of uh, uh, um, variations on that theme in general will have enormous, enormous applications, some scary. Uh, you've seen the videos of, you know, somebody's voice translated onto another person's voice, uh, Obama talking, for instance, and you can get, you, you can tr translate one person's face on another person's voice, one person's hair and so on and so forth. And people are coming up with all sorts of um, interesting applications. So, and, and also, they're also very uh, um, valuable applications, you know, within that type of the space as well. That's a little bit of a digression. I don't want to go into all of that today. But um, this is, uh, it's just telling you a little more again about the richness of deep learning, about how the different types of architectures actually can have meaning and significance that have, you know, a great application. Uh, to everything that we do. So we're, we, we're now in the age of AI and, uh, and you, you kind of have to um, be a part of it, you know, to understand what's going on so that you can make a good positive uh, difference in terms of the applications and the way that you choose to use it. Um, so yeah, uh, big digression there, but let's get back to work. So um, here we are. Um, again, it's the same set of rules that apply. So here you can see that the matrix, because our input um, in, so here, you, just looking at this here, without looking any further, if I just simply looked at that, I can tell that this is a two-dimensional input, and the output is three-dimensional. So I automatically know that it's this part of the network that I'm describing, right here, right? Because you have here the sigma to the k, h1k, right here, and h2k right there, and then uh, you have the weights, and you output h1k you know, uh, to the one, to the K plus one, H1 to the K plus one rather, uh, H2 to the K plus one, and then you do your transformation and your activation. Again, it's the same step over and over and over again. Um, and this again, illustrates the dimensionality and how that uh, affects the output. So nothing new, we just looked at two examples with two different shapes, just to make sure that we can map the description, the shape of a new network to the matrix vector representation of that network. And this tells you that it's a nested process, right? So here you start out with a layer H K minus one uh, and you do the transformation, right? And then the sigma is the nonlinearization of that process and you get a certain output. Now that output of the previous layer becomes the input. You see, sigma h1 to the k is sigma h1 to k is sigma h2 to the k becomes the input of the next network. And then you do the transformation again. You do a non apply nonlinearity to that with your activation function. You get a certain output. You feed that output as input into the next layer and the story continues. And that can then represent your entire network, your entire network can then therefore be nested as a single equation, if you will. Uh, it might be a ginormous equation, but a single equation nonetheless, that's nested where each, each um, input within this nesting uh, is obtained by unraveling, you know, the previous one. Um, and this just kind of illustrates that you can take this and you can blow it up, if you will, you know, and expand the whole thing out and then you'll see what's going on with that, you know, right here. Because this year, if you blow it up, you'll get all of that. And then take this one and blow that up and you get all of that and you can keep going. So what are these activation functions? You know, these things that add nonlinearity, which give you richness and context. Um, question, 
So let's go back to the chat room and you guys should list the uh, uh, different types of activation functions that you've heard of. Relu, good, TanH, Sigmoid, Softmax, TanH. Wow, wow, you guys are on fire. Um, Softmax, yep, good, good. And those, those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. Good, 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 good. Leaky Relu, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Leaky Relu, yeah, that's that's a good one too. Um, Leaky Relu is a play on Relu, but instead of having zero, you have it, it, you, you have some kind of gain uh, in there as well on the negative side. Good, hyperbolic and sigmoid and so on. And, and it's amazing that you, yeah, you guys are very familiar with these. Um, you, you can actually make your own also, depending on the problem that you're solving. And um, Keras and TensorFlow, you know, each give you, uh, they, these are um, high level libraries for machine learning. They give you the flexibility to get in there and, you know, throw in your own uh, loss function, which you often might need to do, depending on what you're solving. Right, and then of course, and then there are people who have never heard of any of these. And thanks for mentioning that. Um, because we have um, a mixed crowd here. So we're, we're going back and forth and making sure that we uh, carry everybody along. Good, so activation uh, functions. So you guys have seen, a lot of you have seen these things. Uh, let's talk about them because not everybody has. Um, sigmoid, this is a sigmoid function. So you can imagine that whatever input it's given, you can see the loss of proportionality. Remember when we, we after we defined linearity and we got our minds around it, we ended up converging on that it's basically encoding, it's ba linearity basically means proportional, a proportional transformation. There are no surprises, right? Uh, the input, if it's double, the output would be double, you know, that type of thing. If you sum two inputs, you would get the, the their outputs would be the sum of their outputs. That's it, that's all linearity is. When you wanna lose linearity, what do you do? So you basically have something that's not a straight line as the output. So that if you're here, this is what you get, right? Right here. And uh, okay, actually let's start here. If I'm here, I'm here. If I double that, so say the green, the green illustrates it better. If I'm here, I get like 0.25, right? If I double that and I go from half to one, now suddenly I'm at 0.75. That's more than double. So you doubled it, but you got more than double the output. So it's, it's a stretching. The idea of stretching or squashing something is the activation. It, that's the linearity. And now we know exactly why you're doing that because you're trying to go from a representation, a pictorial representation of cat to the sort of binary concept of cat, you know, versus dog. And to do that, you have to really do some warping. You know, there's no way you're going to get that there linearly. Um, and that's why we're doing these things. So here you have tan h function. And here you have a sigmoid. The sigmoid is a powerful one. You see that a lot uh, in usage. And this is the mathematical description of the sigmoid function. It's 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, where this is the z here. You can see why it looks this shape, right? So sigmoid never goes below 0, never goes above 1. Right at zero, it's a half, and it just does this snake thing in between that. Between it approaches zero, it never actually touches zero, never actually touches one per se. And when you look here, you'll see that uh, it's one over one plus e to the minus z. Now, the exponential function is a wildly explosive function, e is for explosive. Um, if you get very negative on the exponential on the z, say you're at minus one billion. Well, what does that mean? That means that e to the minus, minus minus 1 billion is e to the 1 billion. Now that, that's an explosion right there. So the bottom blows up, the denominator blows up. And what happens to the whole number? If your denominator is close to infinity, what happens to, what's one over infinity? Zero, it's close to zero. So you keep getting closer to zero as z, as z goes, um, as z goes bigger, more bigger meaning more negative. I should say you could call that smaller, but more negative in magnitude. So this thing goes zero. And Z is getting more positive. What that means is that minus a number is a negative number. 
So e to the minus, e to the negative number is zero. So you have one, one plus zero in effect, and that is one. So, you, but you never actually get there, right? So that's your sigmoid function. And then I talked about ReLU as well. ReLU is one over Z. It's this absolutely linear here. And then for parts that are um, less than, so it's max of zero and Z. For anything that's less than Z, I mean, less than uh, zero, a negative number over this part, it just zeroes out to zero. Um, the the ReLU was sort of a, this that's a little bit of a digression. We're not, it's beyond the scope of, the ReLU was sort of a lifesaver of sorts in, um, in all of this because that, um, you have problems that are called, you have the vanishing gradient or exploding gradient. And we're gonna get into that when we look at stochastic gradient descent in the next two slides, that taking the derivative is a critical step, is the step in optimizing the loss function as we learn how to make our updates, as we learn, as we try to learn how to learn. Um, and when you're dealing with something, when you're dealing with something that is, doesn't really have a gradient, like when you're over here, right? So when you get to large input, large numbers, in this case, large, six is already large, right? When you get to something here like six, if that's the input you're taking in, what's the gradient over here of, the, of that input value? What's the gradient over here where it's almost horizontal? Zero. The gradient of uh, flat, basically there's nothing to learn. So you, you all inputs, no matter what, when anything that's out here, you just, your learning just dies and it just kills the process, you know, like that. And then there's nothing. Um, and so that problem uh, is a problem that's avoided the ReLU uh, function, okay? So that's something that you might've heard of. You might've heard of vanishing and exploding gradients. And this, these are just, you know, a bunch of other loss functions that are available to you. And you can the loss function. What exactly is that? So the, the loss function is very, very important. Um, can you guys give me some examples of loss functions? So I I have them here. So basically, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Log loss, cross entropy, absolutely. And so the the more intuitive ones, when you're starting out, uh, this is you absolutely want to start out with this one, right? Um, this one gives you all the intuition that you need uh, as to why, what exactly is a loss function, um, why do I need it, and how, what does it do for me in the learning process? It's well, it's everything. It's the objective. Um, it's the score. It's the teacher. You know, we, it's called deep learning, right? When you're learning, you need a teacher. The loss function is your teacher. Um, it's the data, it's the annotated data that tells you ground truth. Is this really a cat? Uh, how close to it, how much does it look like a cat? You know, uh, if it's a house, then you're completely off. But if it's a raccoon, you know, then may, uh, you're close or, you know, a dog, you're close. Uh, but if you're talking about a house or a tree, then you're way off. And so it's a way to measure the learning process and give feedback to the algorithm so that you can modify it adjusted accordingly. So um, this is the called the absolute loss function. Uh, this is um, a quadratic loss, you know, and then you can take a square root of that as well. Uh, but you'll notice that this, these are all positive, you know, um, to give you a sense. And then you have um, some more uh, exotic uh, loss functions, but they're they are standard. You know, uh, the binary cross entropy is a standard one. Uh, it's the same thing as the categorical cross entropy, except it's the instance where you have uh, two things. And that's a big use case, right? Uh, is there diabetic retinopathy or not? Uh, is this a cat or a dog or not? And when you look at these, um, this expression, don't be intimidated by that, right? by the binary cross entropy, you'll see logs thrown in there and stuff in there. What does that mean? And then a summation sign, you know, with minus sign in there. What, what is all of this? 
um, uh, do, do not worry. Uh, and that's why I put this here, I put these graphs here to kind of show you where this comes from. Where does this idea come from and what does it encode really? Um, I'm adjusting my time to my pace to make sure that we, we don't go too fast or too slow. Um, so here we have, um, yeah, let's explain this. Let's explain the categorical loss of course entropy. You, back to the whole process, what are we doing in deep learning? You have some data, right, of that you know what they are. Like you have 10 pictures of cats and you want to train your network to be able to recognize what is a cat, right? In your training process, in your, you know, Keras or PyTorch or whatever your favorite flavor of, um, of platform is, of library is, have a data set that has 10 cats and 10 dogs, right? And every time you present a cat and your algorithm says, yes, this is a cat or this is likely to be a cat, you yes or no, it's giving you a prob. Think of it as giving you a probability. It's saying this is, you know, 100% likely to be a cat. That's one uh, probability one. Or it might say it's 25% likely to be a cat. Or it's, you know, 80% likely to be a cat. It's giving you some. We're going to call that alpha of s sub i. Say s sub i is the sample that you're handing to the algorithm to check. As you hand it those samples, so it's giving you that those numbers in a probabilistic manner, probabilities go between what, what range? If I, if I tell you something has a probability, what are the numbers in between that? Probabilities can only be good, 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 great, great, great. I see zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, fantastic. So probabilities are between zero and one. Probability is either zero means it's never gonna happen or probability is one, which means it's definite. And so when you look at the log, the graph of log, um, it looks quite interesting because it goes all the way down to infinity. If you're below one, it starts anything below one, log of anything that's a fraction, like log of a half or log of uh, three quarters, log of 0.9, any number below one has a negative log. The log is negative, see? And then as you get closer and closer to zero, the log goes all the way down to zero, I mean, to minus infinity. And by the time you hit zero, it never really gets to minus infinity, but you know, log of zero is undefined. It's like minus infinity. It's... Um, so now, since that's what the log looks like, that's the red graph. If I, if I multiply every number here by its negative, by negative one, what do I get? I get the blue graph, right? Um, I guess uh, isn't categorical entropy or multi-classification? Absolutely correct. And um, that is absolutely correct. And one example of multi-classification is what? Binary classification. It's where the number of classes equals two. So it's the exact same, it's the exact same loss function that we also call binary cross entropy. It is categorical cross entropy, but it's just more specific to this very important use case where you have two outputs to our two classes. Uh, and, and I'll show you, we'll, we'll see that in this next one here. So, um, so, so you, you flip that minus one and then you get this over here. And this is an interesting looking uh, graph, right? So you're going between zero and one. And when you are at one, what is the value of minus log? What's minus log of one? See from there? Zero, great. Um, so a lot of people say zero, great. A lot of people say zero, fantastic. So you guys got it. So uh, minus log of one, the blue graph is minus log. Minus log of one is zero. What does that mean? So this alpha, alpha take alpha here as the probability that your prediction is the same as the label. So if, if the thing you're passing through to test your model 
is actually a cat, right? Then the probability that and same that means the probability that your is correct is one. So alpha s of i is one. The log of one is zero. What does that do? It means that the loss that you suffer for that you're basically rewarding the algorithm and you get a signal and saying you suffered no loss from this prediction. So you then send a signal to the algorithm and we're going to see what that what that signal means. What's that signal? Those signals are derivatives. We're going to look at stochastic gradient descent and, and back prop in the next couple of slides. So that's the signal that you send back when you got it right. You send a signal of zero back, means zero loss. So that's what this means. So here is the probability. It means that you, you thought it was a cat, your model thought it was a cat, and it is a cat. That's probability one. Log of one is zero. And then this T sub i is the label cat, which you can have it as one or zero if it's binary, or otherwise you have other things in there. Uh, you can weight that if you will. You multiply whatever you multiply by zero, then you get zero. Um, somebody asked, goodness, Okpateya asked that, is it possible to have zero loss? Yeah, if you got it right, then it's zero. Um, if, however, you have, uh, in, as in categorical, you have multiple values, and oftentimes you're training with millions of data sets, right? So it's batches. So one particular discrete data could be right, but in the next one might be wrong. And ultimately you're doing this in an amortized way so that the average, that's, what, that's where the summation comes into play. And oftentimes you have another sum on top of that, which means that you're presenting the data in batches. We're gonna look at that in the next slide. That's the stochastic part of stochastic gradient descent. So now I hope that's clear. You might, you might need to go back and, and uh, look at this slide again to fully uh, make sure you understand it. Uh, somebody says, uh, yeah, so um, good. Make sure you go back and you understand this, but I hope that this is now clear to all of you and that these, this expression would never again be mysterious. Or, and, and when you hear the term categorical cross entropy, you will never again um, uh, or intimidating in any kind of way. Um, it, now you understand it fully. This is the probability that your prediction was correct. The log of that is, does the good work for you of um, zero becomes zero. Uh, if it's one, you got it right, you get no loss. Now, if the problem, if you were so wrong that it was here, big number was the um, negative log, then that means you've got a big loss. And so you'll pass a signal to your model that uh, we got a problem. Houston, we got a problem and you're gonna have to fix that problem. Now, uh, binary cross entropy gets its own uh, slide here simply because that it is such a big use case, right? a lot of things that you're gonna be doing when you actually say, I'm going to go into AI, you often be doing binary. It doesn't, maybe it's not binary, but maybe a lot of times it is. Binary classification gets its own chapter basically. And so when you look at this model, just break this up, you know, where this is the sum, I equals one to two, because now you have only two classes. And I just wrote that out, T1 minus T2. So this is where um, you then have two separate classes, cat versus dog. So say you're throwing in cats and you're throwing in dogs, um, it might get some cats right, some dogs wrong, but basically the loss is just. So if it got a cat, if it gets the cat wrong, the dog wrong, then that's doubly bad. And then you want to fix that. But if it's getting the cats right, the dog's wrong, it's kind of in the middle. It learns that it's not there yet. Again, it's getting the signal. It's getting the message that we got to do better uh, until you finally get it right. Okay. And then this uh, third classification category, which is a uh, very important uh, is called the soft max. And this one is very nice in a way because it encodes scenario in which multi-classification scenario in which the output at the end of your neural network in the loss function is actually the probability. And you enforce that in this manner. So say you have, um, you have uh, a certain number of classes, right? Uh, and you have a certain output and the outputs that you get out of this are exponential functions of the score. SI is a score, right? And those numbers might be large, but what you then do is you take every single class, 
say you have, uh, you're looking at the 10 different types of, say you're looking at a cat, dog, bird, um, a, a rodent, uh, a car, a tree, or whatever. You have 10 different classes. For each output, each prediction would have a score for each of those things. And those numbers are not normalized in any way, but they're, the exponent ensures that they are positive. That's the impact of saying e to the something. Because exponential function, is it ever negative? Question? Is the exponential function ever negative? E to the anything? No, good, never. Somebody put never in all caps, I like that. It's never negative, it's always positive. So that's what the E is doing there. And then you take the, so you have this multi-pronged output. I, in a lot of the examples that I showed, I had the neural network have a binary output, uh, but it can have multiple outputs. We saw, we saw that in some of the examples. Um, and so you'll take the score for any given one and you divide it as a denominator at the sum of all of the outputs where you've exponented all of them. So these are all positive numbers in the denominator being summed together, you get a positive number. The numerator is a positive number and that gives you the score for each class. Now, what special property does this have? The special property it has is that when you then take this thing and you might need to show yourself this offline and you sum this for each class, what do you get? They sum to what? If I sum this for each J, this value alpha S sub I to the I, if this is how you came up with it and you have J different classes, different types of I's and you sum all of them together, you will get one. So that's what you're doing here. So if I take, if I have uh, three numbers, if I have, the, I'm gonna go to the chat room with this. I'm gonna come up with three random, random or actually you guys, you guys come up with the numbers, make sure they're positive. Um, come up with three numbers. Each person should come up with, just put three numbers, type three numbers up in there. Good, I'm gonna take the first one. Somebody said three, four, and nine. We're going with three, four, and nine, okay? So we're good. So the numbers are three, four, and nine. So uh, for the first one, for three, we're gonna say, th three divided by the sum three plus four plus nine. Okay, I'm doing the math in there. Uh, and uh, that's gonna give me, so what's three plus four plus nine? That's seven plus nine, that's 16. So that's three over 16, right? Okay, so that's the first one. And then um, we're gonna now do the next one, which is gonna be what, four divided by, same deal, three plus four, plus nine, and that's gonna give us what? I'm gonna say four over 16, and I, I know it's four, we're just gonna write it like that. And then the last one, we're gonna say nine, divided by same denominator, three plus four plus nine, that's what, nine over 16, okay? And now we've gotten three numbers that have come out. Each of those numbers, first property, each one of those numbers is less than one, right? Because in the sum, you have each number in there. In the first case, I had three in the denominator plus other positive numbers. So that number is gonna be less than one. In the second case, I had four in the denominator plus other positive numbers, gonna be less than one. In the third case, I had nine in the denominator plus other positive numbers, it's gonna be less than one. Now, here's the, the magic of all of it. What is the sum of those three things that we got? Let me, let's do it, let's, let's prove it out. I know, I know. Good, and let's show that. The sum is one, beautiful, you guys got it. Let's, let's prove that out. Three plus, uh, three over 16 plus, four over 16 plus nine over 16 equals to three plus four plus nine over 16, which equals to three plus four, plus nine, I know I'm boring some of you here, but this is very important, trust me. Uh, we can't be more clear on this. Three plus four plus nine, and that clearly equals to one. Boom, good. So that's it, and that's how it comes about. So th that's the beauty of the softmax. The softmax encodes probability in the way that we've just demonstrated. Now this gradient descent, we've got a half hour to go. Um, let's, get into, let's get into gradient descent. So 
we now see, we've seen the loss function, right? We've seen the importance of the loss function, that the loss function is our forcing function, it's our objective function that tells us whether we're right and wrong. And we know that for us to learn, our, our loss function has to be small. It has to be small. And we have to force it to become small. How do you do that mathematically? Where do you even begin um, to, uh, to shrink your loss function, right? Because you know it's telling you whether you are doing well or not. But then that's no use if you can't change the weights so that you do better. Um, but how do you change the weights? What's the weight update rule? How do you come up with the weight update rule? Um, do you guys get where we are with this, where we're at? So now we've seen loss function. We've seen that, yes, loss function measures whether we were right, whether it was a cat or not, and tells us how bad we're doing or how great we're doing. But we have to somehow take that knowledge, that value of the loss function, and then try to do better, try to somehow use that to learn something. Um, and the way you do that is, is a technique called gradient descent. And so here, when you look at this graph, for example, say this f of x is the graph of your loss function, but you can't see it, right? So let's, let's, let's not jump ahead of ourselves. You don't know what your loss function looks like. Here, I'm, I'm drawing the loss function landscape, the loss landscape, as though I know what it is, but I don't. If I did, we'll kind of be done with the problem in a way. Um, or at least we would, have, we would be able to, we would, we would be looking good in a lot of ways. But we, yeah, actually we'll be done because this is, these are the weights here. So you will just pick the weights that give you the minimum and you'll be done. If you had the map of your loss function, your, your problem is solved, uh, but you don't. You don't know what your loss function looks like. You're completely blind, groping in the dark and seeking the minimum of something of which you do not see. You know, God help us, right? So how do we, how do we solve this? So look at this graph. So now these are now hypotheticals. Now these are hypotheticals because don't ever forget that you don't know what your loss function looks like. Because if you did, you, you're done. You, did, you, know, you don't need to train the model. You're, you, you know, you're, you're already completed all your work. Um, the whole goal is to, in fact, our goal is not even to know the full loss function. We, we, there's no way to do that today. That's computationally reasonable. Um, our goal is to hope and pray and guess that we can find ourselves at a local minimum of that loss function that is satisfactory to us. Uh, we end up never actually seeing this graph or knowing what it looks like in effect. Um, we're able to sample it for sure um, for various points. And sure, you know, if you've, if you've got unlimited cloud, if you have, you know, if you're maybe working at uh, DeepMind or Google or somewhere and you, you have a lot of cloud credits, you can just throw in a bunch of random, you can try to exhaust the set of not random numbers, but I, I assure you, um, you can exhaust even Google's resources uh, completely and drain it dry and still not know what the lost landscape looks like. So you probably don't wanna do that. <laughs> Those yet things that's funny, but it's, it's true. <laughs> so you wanna you want to take, you wanna be strategic about this. And what you're gonna do then is if you look at this, uh, this is this is a parabolic function. This is a function, and if I'm here, right, if, if I'm here and I I take a derivative of something, right? If I take the slope, if the slope is negative or positive, it's telling me something. So if I sample, even though I can't see this function, I don't know what it looks like. But if I'm able to get the derivative of the function at this point, right? If the derivative is like this, you guys can see my cursor, right? If the derivative is like this, it's positive, then what that tells me is that I have to go to the left if I want to get smaller. If and I have to go to the right if I want to get larger. So that's all I need in terms of having a guidance of where to go, how to walk. Um, all I need is the gradient. The gradient tells me everything I need to know what's the next step I take. Now, if, if here it's positive, positive means it's going in the direction your intuition will tell you. If you go to the right, 
you're going to increase. If you go to the left, you're going to decrease. But guess what? The next question you have to solve for yourself is step size. If I take too big a step, what happens? So sure, it's true up to a point. The greatest positive here, if I move this much, I decrease. If I move this much, I decrease. But if I say, oh, greatest positive here, I'm going to jump like that. Guess what? You actually increase. You got worse. So that's another parameter of learning that's heuristic, that we're the idea that you're blind to what, where you are and you have to guess is a lot of, of what uh, deep learning is about. Um, so you do that, you play that game until you find your minimum. But it turns out that even that is uh, computationally expensive. Again, you can drain, dry all the resources of Google, Amazon, and Microsoft combined um, by trying to solve the, these problem uh, in a way that is not computationally effective and efficient. And so as a result of that, you do some heuristic uh, accelerations uh, to this process. And, and um, yeah, somebody say even using TPU, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, it, it's all about uh, when you look at comp uh, algorithmic complexity, uh, if you're talking about mapping the landscape of an arbitrary problem uh, with fine granularity, that is a problem that will, I would wager, will exhaust you know, the resources of all of those three organizations combined today. Um, and so, yes, you know, there's, a, there's importance of research, of finding out how can we accelerate, uh, TPU is a tensor processing unit, yeah. Uh, how can we accelerate computation uh, and, and, uh, and be able to make progress? And a lot of this comes down to approximations uh, and smart moves. So here's an example. So you have a ton of data. And remember that there are many data, data points. Somebody asked a good question last time about um, whether, you know, whether you can have a loss of zero. I'm like, yeah, you can have you know, a loss of zero. At the end of the day, it's about amortization. It's an average. Uh, and so when you have millions and millions of data, what direction do you move in? Because some of those data points are telling you go to the left. Some are telling you go to the right, right? And so it's the sum of them. But it, and it turns out that you can do batches and mini batches and walk. And instead of taking all million, all of the 1 million data, you can take a sample of 100 of them, right? Find out the loss at the point where you're at that those 100 together have, take the gradient and whatever direction that that 100 tells you to move, you move everybody in that direction. And you're not going in a straight line all the time you're not going in a smooth line because there's arbitrariness to that approximation. There's stochasticity to it. So you end up going in mini batches that are doing a random walk, but they're going in the right way ultimately. Uh, your batch size cannot be too small because otherwise you will be wasting your time. Olaf um, Emomotosho is, is so enjoying this. Thank you for the great feedback. Um, so otherwise you'd be wasting your time if you take too small of a batch. So batch sizes are typically have to be reasonable some of the standardized batch sizes that you would see for some uh, Im computer vision problems, that's image classification problems and things like Keras and PyTorch, numbers like 32, 64, and things like that. But then your, your, even your image sizes can be quite small. You know, some, uh, I think CIFAR 10 might even have tiny images like 28 by, and you might get images as large as 1,000 by 1,000, 4,000 by 4,000, and so on. It all depends. So this whole field, is a very heuristic field. You just have to uh, figure out um, what the solution to each problem is, you know, as you go. Uh, and uh, Oyeka Okonkwo's notes are already four pages long. Wow, fantastic. Okay, good. So let's see. And so well, how exactly do you do this? So we've seen a pictorial, a pictorial example of um, CIFAR 10 is, uh, thank you for that update. Um, uh, tells us that CIFAR 10 is 32 by 32, tiny images like thumbnails, while MNIST are 28 by 28. Um, so the weight, weight updates are done in this manner. So let's look at this very carefully. This is very important to understand the math behind this. So we've seen that the gradient, the derivative dy dx, tells us encodes the information about what direction to go in when you are seeking the minimum of your loss function of your lost landscape. 
um, we've seen that step size matters, right? It tells you the direction, but it doesn't tell you how far to go. And we've seen that if you go too far, you can actually worsen it. So, so this is the gradient, the derivative of the loss with respect to a certain weight. the weight of that particular edge you know in the graphical language you have nodes and edges so the connection is a is um the weight to get the next weight in the iteration you have to subtract this value you have um if this is if the the loss is right what that means is that as you increase this weight the loss decreases right as you increase this weight the loss so that's the rate of change of the loss with respect to that weight so you then want to go ahead and decrease this weight does that make sense so that's why you would then subtract from this weight. If on the other hand, this is very important. So we're gonna, let's state it the reverse way. We still have a little bit of time. Uh, let's state it in the converse. If the loss increases with respect to this weight, right? That means that this value here is a positive. So if you say that as you increase the weight, your loss increases, then that's not good. So you don't want to have an increased loss function. You want to have a decrease in your loss function. So that becomes a subtraction. If, if this part here is negative, if the relationship between the, the loss and the weight uh, is negative, then you want to add that value to that. So negative times negative is positive. So if this weight is adversely affecting the loss, then you like the direction that weight is going in you're gonna go ahead and just execute this equation as is, and everything will work out beautifully because you're taking a negative value, multiplying that by a negative, negative times negative is positive. So the value of that weight would increase and therefore the loss would decrease. So um, this might take, you know, looking at it again and again, but it works out beautifully. Please, sir, can you come again? Uh, yes, so um, let's, so, if the, so you have two options, right? So the weight is either increasing the loss or decreasing the loss. Back to this shape here. So the weight is either increasing the loss or decreasing the loss. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're at this point, say this is the weight X, this is the X axis. X is now a W if you will. And uh, Y is an L or a loss. If where you are in the graph is such that when you increase the weight, you increase the loss. What that means is that the derivative at that point is what, positive or negative? It's positive, right? So because you want to go, you want to get the lower the loss function, it means that you have to go to the left. So that means that you have to decrease the value of that weight. So this picture is a, it's a beautiful picture that explains all of it for you. And that equation essentially encodes that concept. So we're at a point here with a positive derivative. That's dl dw. Back to this. So if dl dw is positive, right? That means that you're here, positive, right? Positive slope. You want to go in the decreasing direction, which means you want to subtract positive number from the value of that weight and get a lower value on the next iteration. If on the other hand, you are somewhere like here with a negative slope, that's dl dw is negative, right? If you increase the weight at that point, 
you will increase, you will decrease the slope. So there you want to increase the weight, but the derivative is negative and negative times negative is positive. So the same equation works out right there as well. So there the slope was negative, negative times negative is positive, and therefore you go in the positive direction. Good. Um, uh, Chukwemeka says that he understands, it's very clear. Martha says, I understand, perfect. All right, very good. So um, now we're gonna look at the chain rule and uh, the chain rule is, is very important, is one of the key uh, equations within calculus. And the chain rule would give us a beautiful trick called back propagation. And it's really chain rule in reverse is back propagation. So the loss function is, remember we had the activation functions, we had weights. So it's a composite function. Your, your entire neural network is a composite function. And we, we went into extensive, uh, we, we, we had several slides that showed that extensively at the very beginning that uh, a, any neural network can be roped into a single equation that is a nested equation. The reason we, went, we did all of that is for this point to become clear, more clear now that we're here. And so when you have a composite function of this kind, the chain rule tells you that the rate of change of the loss with respect to the weight, we know that that's a very important parameter for us because this is what tells us what direction to go in. The way you do that is simply you'll take the derivative of the inside with respect to the inside. So you just work it outside and then multiply by the derivative of same thing um, of the outside here with respect to the inside. And you think of these as crossing themselves out. That's exactly what's going on. That's correct intuition. And that's actually exactly what happens. So you're left with DLDW, you get this. This is the chain rule. So um, if you're not uh, very clear on the chain rule, you have to go back and revise that because that's central to machine learning. Uh, and then the same thing here expressed showing you that it doesn't matter how many layers that you have, you can just do the exact same thing. So I'm gonna say to get the rate of change of L with respect to W, any given weight, I can just say uh, d sigma dW times d, the next value, value d beta d alpha, next value d sigma d beta, next value dL d sigma, multiply all of that together and you'll get dL dW. Now, how, how do we use this chain rule? We use it in back propagation. Again, we're not looking to exhaust all the resources of big tech companies. And so we need uh, clever tricks. Function of a function, absolutely. It's a composite function. Uluagwenga Uribo Guje says, and you're on point. Um, so we are, we're going to have, need a clever trick to be able to do this because otherwise it'll be too computationally expensive. And so here we are. So we have two processes, right? So we have the process in which you are taking that picture of the rat now or the cat, transforming that by convolution. You have those three points, x1, x2, x3. We went over that at the beginning. And then you're doing those matrix multiplications. Then you do activation, you do matrix multiplication, you do activation. You're wa walking your way forward to get to your prediction. So you are touching every single node along the way. And as you go forward, you have the input weights and then you have the output, which becomes the input for the next thing. So the clever trick here is you, you go ahead and um, compute derivatives as you go and store them in each node because you're already there. It doesn't cost you anything extra to, to hear, say, what is DW1 DF? You compute that and you store it in this node. What is DW2 DF? You store it in this node and then you carry on with your computation. The reason is when you're coming back, you're going to need that to use the chain rule and you're gonna unwrap that process, walking backwards, solving all your problems along the way is what you're going to do. So then you get all the way to the loss. Now you get the loss function, you've got a prediction, you compare it to the data and it's either great or bad, but you've got some kind of signal, some kind of message, that signal that you have to then transfer backwards to update all the weights. And we've just seen the weight update rule very clearly, and you all asserted that you understand that, or, uh, or uh, some of you, at least uh, most of you. So you then go back, and as you're walking backwards, you have the loss for this iteration. And at this very point, 
this output that was going out, you, you have the value coming in as an input, the LDF as a number. But remember that on your way going forward, you computed DF, DW1, DF, DW2, right? Now we're just going to use chain rule and multiply DL, DF by DF, DW1. We already have this at, stored at that node. And that gives us, guess what that gives us? DL, DW1. And that's all we need to update the weight W1 because we have a weight update rule for that. And that's how you get DLDW1, DLDW2. So by being smart and doing some work on your way forward, you only have to do a little bit of work on your way backwards and sequentially you get all of that. Like this DLDW1 is then the input going backwards. It's, it's, wow, you guys are amazed by this. I'm so glad that you see the power of this. Ucheria, um, Akim, and Kendi, um, says that this is massive and it's mind blowing. Uh, Michael Ajiboy says this is mind blowing. It's really mind blowing. I'm glad that you guys appreciate this. So um, some of you might need to go back and look at this again and see the cleverness of this back propagation technique. And um, so Oluagbenga uh, wants to know how these relationships um, relate to real world problems. We cannot do, so this, th this is the way that your TensorFlow 2.0, your PyTorch, you know, your Keras are solving. Whenever you tell it to wire something up and do something, this is the process that's going on. And they've already encoded that inside of those libraries. And you can open those libraries and look at the exact you know, encoding of that uh, for this to happen. So looking at this, it's such an important concept. I'm um, just taking a look at, at that again. Uh, if you have X going in and Y, uh, X and Y as inputs, Z as an output, right there and then on your forward pass, you quickly compute the rate of change of the output with respect to the input, so each of the inputs and store those. Those are called local gradients. So here, DZ, DX, DY, DZ. Um, in the previous slide, we were using, we were saying W1 and W2, and we were saying F here, we're saying Z, X, Y, same, same deal. And then on your way back, you have, the rate of change of the loss with respect to Z, and you can simply compute those because you already have these stored. You just take a DZ, DY, and multiply that by the input, DL, DZ, according to the chain rule that gives you DL, DY, with which you then update uh, Y and get the updated version of Y. That's the whole process of, of, um, of updating the, uh, these. And so back propagation works in that manner. Um, it's quite a beautiful algorithm. Um, and, and we have the update rule and we have this iterative process that just goes in circles all the way around. So in our case, where we have retinal images, uh, we do um, the convolutional steps and then you get a F FC7 uh, layer here, uh, which is the uh, fully, fully connected layer. And then you then throw that into a densely connected network and just do that exact process iteratively and then it goes around. So there's a forward pass mm -hmm. where you're storing local gradients. Then there's a back pass where you're doing back propagation and updating weights. And then you continue that until convergence, until hopefully you find the bottom of this. Um, fantastic. And um, so yeah, back, the whole process, learning process is from error. The error is the loss. So this L in here is the loss or the, the, the value. And that value changes with each iterative step. The loss is gotten right here. And then you go back and you, you figure uh, out how to do the weight updates you know, in that case. All right, so I'm gonna pass this along as, as uh, homework for you guys. We have about uh, 10 minutes to go. Um, this has been an awesome session. Um, so the homework is, you know, yes, you have uh, algorithms such as, I mean, you have a layer um, uh, uh, libraries such as Keras, TensorFlow 2.0, PyTorch that have implemented a lot of these things in the background and you're not having to implement them from scratch.
scratch, thank God. But for you to truly understand what's going on with neural networks and for you to be involved in any kind of research to improve the state of the art, uh, you have to do this by yourself from scratch and build a neural network from scratch with nothing but you know Python. No libraries, no Keras, no nothing. And it doesn't have to be a, a big um, a network. Um, uh, you have to, uh, you have to, you should do a two layer network and use, use real data, real numbers and train it and do the iteration and see how things go. All right. So uh, as a final before, cause I want at least to give you guys at least five minutes for questions. Um, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of, you know, insights, you know, from say a career perspective on data science, you know, what the landscape is like. Um, we're looking at sort of the core machine learning data science, you know, in this class, there are clearly tons of applications. Um, there's tons of research that's going on. Um, if, if you're going to be involved in research, you know, you have to uh, read, you know, archive papers, you know, make sure you're up to date with the state of the art. And, you know, clearly you have to have a fundamental grasp on understanding. You have to know linear algebra, cold, um, and then, you know, continue to think and iterate. This field is a heuristic field. And so um, you, uh, that's what you do with that. In terms of uh, data engineering, um, the, so a lot of data science will become, you know, fairly commoditized. You're already seeing that even in, in how our work has become more simple and uh, data science will be a key part of, of any process throughout society and throughout life. And a lot of those things can, would become enterprise solutions that are out of the box, you know, largely. Uh, the thing that you want to position yourself very well in this field, I would highly strongly recommend that you add technologies to your skill set, um, you know, JavaScript, you know, Django, you know, do some back and front end stuff as well, uh, because a lot of the work ultimately, you know, the data science part, in you know, a model, um, it's great to be able to attain state of the art results. Um, that is not often for in a lot of applications, it's not a daily activity uh, per se, but in terms of the web, the technologies, building those things and uh, being a part of the full integration stack uh, and also understanding the business of particular domains and the domain knowledge of those domains uh, requires focus and requires a lot of work. And so um, to keep that in mind uh, so that you're, you're well positioned um, in this, in this uh, area. Uh, if you have an interest, you know, whether it's agriculture or pharmacy or something of that sort, whatever the case might be, you can deepen your knowledge in that area while anchoring yourself there. Um, if you are a generalist, uh, as long as you're good with web technologies and you have that in, in addition to your repertoire and your skill set, that's great. For people that are going to be exclusively data science people, um, I think that you would have to strive to be uh, doing some kind of research and be up to speed on the state of the art. And then there's this third category, data science, where um, some people have very practical knowledge. You know, my brother, for example, uh, is able to combine a lot of these things. He's not just, he's in the research and the engineering as well as the data science. He's a Kaggle Grandmaster. He gave a talk here last year. Um, David Odaibo. So you, you want to be, if you're going to, so there's another category, which is very cold. Um, he happens to have additional skills like engineering and enterprise and business, but, but that is a unique skill by itself. So if you're going to just do data science, you can, but make sure you're on Kaggle, make sure you're competing, make sure you're on Zindi, make sure that you know um, all the state-of-the-art algorithms, VAEs and GANs and all those types of things. And you don't have to be a web engineer. You don't have to, you know, be, be you don't even have to be doing research. You just have to know how to be able to get the best algorithm. Uh, on the other hand, you can say I'm a PhD type of a person and I'm, I'm working on, you know, state-of-the-art things and the next type of technologies there. One would be looking more at um, academic labs, uh, universities and academic lab, industrial labs. And then there's data engineering, which is this is the person that you're always going to have a job. Um, there's plenty of work for you. You know, you're always going to be busy. Uh, so this is kind of this is kind of the sweet spot. You know, if you ask me, uh, you you know data science and you you know Java, Django, and and uh, and whatever else. And then there's enterprise data science. This is more the purview of the big companies that are looking to bring data science to the world. Uh, and so this is kind of uh, a different thing by itself. So you know, that's it for me. Uh, this has been so enjoyable. You know, on my end, uh, we still have about eight minutes on our clock before we're automatically kicked out of here. And so I'm gonna turn over to you guys for questions on this talk on deep learning or
Christ. Oh, awesome. Thanks a lot, Doctor. It's been an awesome session with you. And uh, the feedback has been really <laughs> inspiring and awesome too. So if you have any question, please drop the question quickly in the chat. Yeah, I see several, yeah. From there. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, this has been great. Um, I've been nominated for prime minister, apparently. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And um, you know, somebody asked if you can use NumPy for the homework. Yeah, you can use NumPy for the homework. Just uh, no, nothing that actually implements a neural network you know, at, at the core. Somebody was asking what skill sets a data engineer should have. Um, I, I saw the question in here somewhere. Yeah, so basically, you know, web technologies, you know, web technologies and DevOps, that intersection uh, is, is very, very vital, I would say. Um, and it, it gives you a lot of range um, and uh, it's just so needed, you know, for business in general, business process, business runs on, on web, you know, and that's the way it was 20 years ago. That's the way it'll be 20 years from now. And so that's a great skill set to add to your data science. And if you want to be, um, you want to be highly sought after. Um, and, you know, there are different flavors, you know, there's different things out there. Pick, pick your pick, you know, whether you want to do some mobile, some React Native, some, you know, some uh, Django, some whatever flavor of, you know, stay up to date, you know, and, you know, become familiar with cloud technologies as well. Amazon Web Services is a lion's share of the market for sure, but I personally like Google Cloud um, quite a bit. Uh, it's uh, it's not nearly as, as versatile and ubiquitous uh, in terms of its uh, commercial state, uh, but, but I think it's very neat and it's very well integrated into a lot of the native technologies, cloud native. Uh, things like uh, Kubernetes was a project out of Google called Borg. Um, there's, uh, you know, they also have some ML ops uh, out of the box things that came out of their stack as well. Um, stuff like um, Kubeflow, and then, uh, you know, uh, different projects that are merging together. Um, if you're looking at the DevOps side of things, you know, it's it's fascinating the extent of which you can get things like the service mesh and Istio. There's a lot of development happening there. Uh, the various companies contributed to that: Lyft, Envoy. IBM and so on. So just keeping your, your keeping your hands in you know in implementation. Think of how the key question to ask yourself is: What if you were by yourself on an island and you had to deploy a solution? You know, what would you would you be able to do it? You clearly, most no no one would, but you know, kind of that kind of gets you to know where the fire is and where you have to be, in what direction you have to be moving. There was another question. I only take at least one question. I think I have four minutes. Um, so what are, Chidoz Agwo says, what are some of the biggest open challenges in deep learning, especially for someone looking at research? Oh boy, you know, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of questions. Um, there, there are so many questions, you know, it depends on your flavor. For instance, why do, why do these models work, right? Um, what's like, that's not a fully understood question. Uh, it's clear that we can't just arbitrarily increase the length of, of models and get, you know, get them to keep doing better. You know, at some, at some point you begin to overfit, um, but actually understanding that interpretability is another one. Um, there's been a little bit of progress there with class activation mapping, et cetera. Um, but still, you know, being able to dissect the model out and make it less of a black box is something that has significant relevance, you know, in healthcare and medicine in a lot of areas as well. And then, you know, various uh, improvements in federated learning. How can we learn while maintaining privacy? Um, how can we improve that process, you know, and our understanding of that? I believe there are break breakthroughs um, yet to be made in that area. Um, you said you were going to discuss things to focus on going into deep learning. I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Uh, let's see, uh, can you suggest resources uh, that people from non-quantitative backgrounds can use. Oh yes, you know, the web, YouTube, the medium and Stack Overflow. And so the key thing is, you know, first you know, first things first, if you're not from a quantitative background, first thing would be to learn Python um, and then to do your best, you know, to understand, to learn calculus from, from the web as well as linear algebra. 
And then once you're there, you know, go ahead and start working, you know, uh, train, you know, train the um, CFR 10 data set. Uh, and there's a lot of recipes online. And as soon as you get stuck, just go back and look it up right there. Just Google it and you'll see that somebody else has had that exact problem before. Um, somebody, uh, so Uli MVC Yesufu wants to ask uh, if we could learn more or have more resources about diagnosing diabetics from the retina state, state using deep learning. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, there's, um, there are open source uh, data based sets available. There's one on Kaggle from the IPAX data set for diabetic retinopathy uh, that you can get your hands on and start, start to, uh, to play with. And uh, you'll be fascinated by what you see there for sure. Um, Mohamed Yanadi says, uh, sir, you are a, an AI full stack engineer. What are your, what is your advice and resource for, um, for someone that wants to be a machine learning full stack? I would say that just start building, you know, get your hands uh, dirty quickly and just jump in. Like, don't hesitate. The engineer doesn't think before they act. And that's not a pejorative statement. It's the opposite of a mathematician who thinks uh, but never acts. And so, <laughs> so you want to be somewhere in between. Uh, and, and basically, when you want to be, to be an engineer, you want to be an engineer. And then you can go back in and, and add some finesse uh, to wherever you think is needed. Um, uh, please, I, I want to get this particular session recorded. I believe it's yeah, we have deep learning. Recorded. We have recorded. Okay. Great. Yeah, deep learning, you know, I would say I would say when you're starting out, you know, books might be not the fastest way to get into the game. You use YouTube and Stack Overflow and some of the things that I exactly should we follow to be full-time engineer, learning engineers. You know, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of dedication. Roll your sleeves up. I know what the standard is, you know, it's a lot of hard work. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, guys. I believe we're going to automatically kicked out in a minute, but this has been wonderful. I had so much fun. And you guys can reach out to me on um, on uh, Twitter. Uh, Esodaibo, I believe, is my Twitter handle. Yeah. All right. Thanks Perfect. a lot, Doctor. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. It's really wonderful. Yeah. With you. Absolutely. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Let's appreciate Doctor. We are leaving out now. Just click on leave uh, breakout room so that you can join the main session. Thank you. Everyone for being part Perfect. Of Thank you so much. Yeah, bye.